Good morning, everyone. I cannot believe that I'm finally here. It's insane. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's the second OzCon, right? Second? Technically the first OzSecCon. OzSecCon. <laughs> I bet. We're going to speak about OzCon now. Okay, very good. All right, well, um, thank you so much for coming. Um, my real name is Sophie. Most of you uh, might know me on Twitter as Jack Hyde. Um, I, I'm a physical penetration tester, and I do um, work for Walmart. So I'm just going to go ahead and get this out of the way now, the obligatory disclaimer. Um, can't talk about my jobs for Walmart. I'm not speaking for my employer. And um, the stories I do tell, dates and characters, names and stuff like that have been changed around just a little bit to protect the an anonymity of my clients. OK, back to it. So uh, I guess it was about three months ago, I was uh, at a baby shower for a friend. Her whole family was there, including her father, who I got to talking with a little bit. And it turns out he was a pretty, uh, he was an engineer for a pretty prominent um, defense contractor. I was like, OK, you just got a little bit more interesting. He wasn't a mark or anything, but you like, you like picking up information about how things work at other companies and what people do. And so uh, he's telling me a little bit about his job, and the conversation turns. He says, so what, what, is, what is it that you do? Well, I am a, uh, oops, I work for the Walmart Red Team. Um, and basically what we do is you've heard about the hacks, like for Target or Home Depot or the credit agencies, Ashley Madison. Each of these had a criminal organization, criminal mind behind the hack. And so that's what the Red Team does, is we are employed by Walmart to attack their computer systems and see if we can't approach the company in a way that would result in a pretty major data breach. And he goes, well, that's really interesting. So you work with computers. I was like, no, I'm not really. Not me. Um, I work with a bunch of hackers. But when it comes to computers, I don't consider myself one of them. Um, what I do for the red team is I break into buildings. I use covert entry methods or social engineering to see if I can't worm my way into secure facilities for my team. And he says, that's fascinating. That sounds like it's got to be the coolest job in the world. And I love telling people about what I do for a couple reasons. Because they look at me like I'm crazy, scary, or awesome. And I'm OK with all of those things. So he, he thought it was pretty great. And I said, yeah, I know. It's the coolest job in the world. I'm basically a professional burglar. <laughs> and he says, again, that's really cool. But why exactly would a group of hackers need a burglar? Like, you don't work with computers. So what, do you, like, what is the purpose of you being on the team? Which is a fair question. And I said, well, think about your office. Think about your space. If I can get physical access inside of your secure facility, how much information could I get my hands on? What sort of confidential stuff do you have laying around? How easy is it to get access to computers or server rooms? And he says, well, that's awesome, but there's no way you can get into my building. And I love this attitude. I said, really, you sound super confident. He says, yeah. And out of his back pocket, like he had it with him at his daughter's baby shower, he pulls something out and sets it on the table between us like it's a winning hand. He says, we have badges. <laughs> And that was basically my reaction. <laughs> I'm not seeing this man as stupid, because this is a really common sentiment. We see it all over the place. And this was originally much bigger font. I don't know why it made it so small. And you know, you get the idea. In badge we trust. The thing is, these people don't work in security. We work in security. They have other jobs. He was an engineer. They're accountants. They're lawyers. They're doctors. It's not up to them to do our job, and it's not up to us to do theirs. They have jobs that I don't understand. 
and probably don't involve a mild state of constant paranoia, which has got to be nice. <laughs> so when you think about it, these slides are out of order. I hate it when that happens. So they trust us. They trust us to do our job. And this leads to what um, my friend Tinker Set calls uh, secure facility syndrome, where a building is like an egg. And I use a Cadbury egg because I'm a child. But the outer shell is, is harder. The perimeter is more difficult to get past. It takes a lot of, it takes more effort to get past the front door. But once you're inside, it's a little bit more squishy. It's easier to maneuver inside. Oh, my font's all messed up. Anyway, if you think about it, it, most people spend about a third of their waking hours or their, their lives at work. They don't want to spend all of that time in a place that feels like a prison. And so when it comes to office culture, they want it to be more open and friendly. They want a place where they can trust their, their hang out with their coworkers, have fun, learn from each other, do their, learn from each other and do their jobs. And they want their office to be a place where they can go and, and trust the people inside. And so they do things like this, leaving their computers unlocked when they leave their desk. There's all sorts of, there's all sorts of OPSEC fails in this photo. And because of that, because of those lax security measures, once you get past the perimeter of the building, it's a jackpot for criminals for somebody like me who wants to get at access, specifically access for my team of hackers who are back home. We're not just talking about physical valuables. What I'm after is logical computer information. So be bad guys with me for a little bit. I want to walk you through uh, one of my one of my first gigs, actually, as a physical penetration tester. It was, um, I guess, late 2016. I got a phone call from a friend of mine, Matt, who does network penetration testing. And he says, hey, Jack, do you, uh, are you interested at all in breaking into a building with me in Ontario? And I was like, ask me another easy question, Matt, of course. And so this was going to be my first international penetration test. And it was just Canada, but still. <laughs> So, like I said, um, Matt had called me up. Um, he, was, he was my network penetration tester. I was going to be focusing on the physical and social side. And we also had TJ, who was a local guy, worked for our company. Um, and he was basically acting as our guide and driver once we, once we got on site. So the first thing... Um, we do is we, we talk to the client about, well, what are our goals? Once we get into this facility, what are we after? They were working on a new product that they were going to be rolling out, something that they considered to be kind of a cash cow. And so they said, we want to see if you can get access to information about this particular product. And anything else you can get your hands on while you're there, um, we would be interested to know what you can get. And so the first thing I'm going to do when I get the address to a facility that I'm targeting is look it up on, on Google Maps. And so I saw we were facing a, a large size office building that was surrounded um, on like three sides by a parking lot. The parking lot was open. Anyone could drive in and out of this parking lot. Uh, note to female presenters, make sure your outfits have pockets. <laughs> so anyone could drive in and out of this parking lot. But in order to get past um, the parking lot and approach the building, you had to cross um, a, a set of turnstiles like this and the rest of the perimeter of the building. Uh, had barbed wire fences. Um, 
we were also told on the call, on the uh, scoping call with the client, um, to be very careful because they had armed guards. And I am not so much worried about armed guards in what I do because I'm small and non-threatening and nobody's going to be so trigger happy that they're going to be like, you don't belong here and immediately shoot me. So I wasn't terribly worried about that. <laughs> um, the only thing that was outside of this like secure enclosed area that the building was in that we were really interested in was the dumpster enclosure. Um, it was kind of set off on the other side of the parking lot by itself. And we thought that was kind of interesting, but they didn't want it like pressed up against the building, I guess, because dumpsters are gross. But um, when we saw the, the first picture, the first time we drove by, the dumpster enclosure was unlocked. And we thought, why not go dumpster diving? Now, why, why would somebody do this to themselves? Why, why go dumpster diving? Well, it, there are a lot of reasons not to, right? And it really boils down to a couple things. You don't want to get in trouble, and it's icky. It's gross. Nobody likes being on the inside of a dumpster. But there are a lot of reasons to go dumpster diving. Just like nobody particularly likes dumpsters, nobody expects somebody else to want to jump into one. They expect that whatever they throw away is never again going to be seen by the eyes of another human being. And so people get rid of a lot of I hate to use the word in this context, juicy information. <laughs> so we decided to, to go for it. Um, the problem was in this picture, this was the only time we saw the dumpster actually unlocked. Every time we drove by after that, it was, it was locked up. Um, and it had this uh, like U shape of, of bushes around the outside of it. But we thought that's not too, too bad. We might need to go into this, like, it, like sneak through the bushes in order to get to the dumpster enclosure, because right on the other side of this uh, of this gate was the building, and there was a camera directed straight at the dumpster enclosure. And you don't want to expose yourself yourself any more than you absolutely have to. So we were thinking we were going to sneak through the bushes, have Matt kind of boost me over the wall. I'd grab a couple bags and throw them down to him. Until we got on site and realized that uh, we're surrounded by holly bushes. <laughs> and Matt was like, yeah, no. <laughs> this, is, this is what um, Rob calls defensive shrubbery. Is that correct? <laughs> So I was like, OK, well, I guess we're going to have to go around the front. And I knew from previous on-site recon that we were facing a Master 175. Um, I see some nods going on. So some of you know that there is a pretty well-known vulnerability to this particular lock, which is um, this cutaway is beautiful, by the way. It is not mine. Um, I found it on lockpick forums. But if you stick a, a little, we call it a decoder, but it's such a small a small shim essentially between these uh, wheels, you can pop up this triangle shaped um, tongue, if you will, and that releases the shackle. And so I had my decoder ready. Um, TJ dropped Matt and I off at the, the corner near where the dumpster was, and I walked up, and it didn't matter because it was unlocked anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very squeaky door. <laughs> so we didn't have to worry about this necessarily. We opened the, opened the gates. We got to toss um, like four pretty large bags out, um, stuck them in the back of TJ's car, which he was thrilled about, let me tell you. Um, but we took it back to HQ and spent about four hours digging through these bags and like brushing all the nasty off it and like all the leftover lunches and, and coffee grinds. It wasn't pretty, but uh, it was 
worth it. Um, there were lots of little like pieces of paper that had been ripped up, which tells me that they're important. And chances are really good that somebody ripped up these pieces of paper thinking there's no way anybody is going to take the time. Nobody is going to bother piecing all these little pieces of paper back together. Hi, I'm someone who would bother. <laughs> I, spend, I spent probably too much time piecing these little puzzles back together. And we found some really good information. Um, a lot of internal emails, a lot of uh, information about different meetings, different, um, different deals that were being made. Um, there's a lot of internal vernacular, which is very, very helpful if you want to pull any sort of social engineering assessment. Because if you drop the right internal acronym in the right context, it gets you a long way. It gives you a lot of credibility. There was one particular item of information that we really internalized, which was the date and time of the shareholders meeting, which was happening while we were there. Big things like this are big opportunities for an attacker. Um, it means a lot of new faces, means changes in schedule, which directly leads to this like uncertainty, just a general toss up of um, the norm, which is a vulnerability and provides an opportunity for someone like me. Um, the absolute icing on the crap dumpster cake, though, <laughs> was this. Um, somebody had, but these aren't employee credentials, someone had uh, not the real ones, just so you know, these are not the real, the real creds. Somebody had written down their employee number, their username, and their password, and kind of half-heartedly scratched out the password, because, you know, security. <laughs> and uh, it was really easy to decode what was going on here. And so I was super excited. I was like, could this be it? Like, have we, have we already gotten uh, what we need? And I went online, I did some, I did some digging. Um, Sophia Valles is the name I came up with to cover uh, the, real, the real mark here. But um, we found her, she was working as a project manager for this target, for this target site. And I was like, let's see if we can log in with her creds. Like maybe she has any, like, like we know what the portal is for our employees. Maybe she has access to what's going on inside of this particular project that we were tasked with finding information on. Which is when we realized, when we tried to log in with this, that they were protected with YubiKeys. If you are not familiar with YubiKeys, um, they're little USB device-like things that you plug into a computer and it spits out this encrypted code that some beautiful mind genius figured out. Uh, and basically, the password is something you know, the UB key is something that you have. And between the two, it lets the system know, hey, this person is legit, you can let them in. Sophia had her UB key. I did not have physical access to that, and I can't decode a UB key. So, um, for the moment, having her creds was fun, but it didn't really do us any good. And we decided to go ahead and move forward with the attack. And the UV key is addressed, is designed to address this very problem because people can get a little bit loosey goosey with their creds. Um, might accidentally give them away in a phishing email or throw them away in a dumpster. So we went on site a couple more times and we did walk arounds of the building as if we were, just as if we were ordinary employees who were like taking a break and going on a walk. This facility was large enough where we weren't too worried about being noticed as anomalies, people who didn't belong. And we were passing one of the turnstiles when I heard Matt get this like celebratory little yes. I was like, what? He says, I have the equipment we need the equipment we need to clone these badges. I had no idea, much like um, our engineering friend at the beginning of my talk. 
that this was even possible. <laughs> I was like, what? what witchcraft is this? What are you talking about? So we went back to uh, the hotel where he showed me the boss cloner. Um, and he explained to me that this was a reader that had an uh, automatic rewrite, read-write capability. So I didn't even have to like go back to my car or go back to the hotel. It would automatically read this low-frequency HID card if I got it close enough to one of the legit employee's badges. I was like, okay, awesome. Yeah, I can do that. I got tagged. Oh, by the way, the, uh, the Boss Cloners um, tagline, they're not sponsors or anything, but I love their, their motto. Get in, get sexy, get out. <laughs> My kind of people. So I got tagged for this particular um, part of the assessment for a couple of reasons. Um, Matt is a big man. Former Marine, um, former bodyguard, bald, scary looking dude, big, big bushy beard, you know the type. People would notice him getting closer to them. <laughs> People have a, a bubble around them where if you get too close without good reason, you start setting off alarm bells. Um, and political correctness or not, like there are some advantages some people have um, of pushing those barriers that other people do not have. Um, I am, I'm a comparatively small woman. I'm non-threatening. I don't look scary. And uh, there's a lesson I learned a couple years back that pregnant women can get away with all sorts of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> We are treated like princesses, even though we are clumsy and silly and needy. And people open doors for us, and they get us things. It's a tailgating dream. Um, but in this, <laughs> in this case in particular, um, I just wanted to uh, bump up my level of, of uh, innocence. And yes, you too can be a pregnant woman <laughs> for $66.99 at Walmart. <laughs> I'm looking at you right now. <laughs> so now I have the cloner, the boss cloner. I have the belly. I have a fake employee badge that I had made with no functionality, just like a picture of, of myself in the format of their, um, of their employee badges. Uh, and all of the gear that Matt had given me in order to do this assessment. And now I just need an excuse to approach someone and build enough rapport to get close enough to them in order for the boss cloner to get a read. And so I arrive in the parking lot and I'm waddling around and I see a young woman sitting on a bench in the parking lot like waiting for a ride or something. Um, and so I kind of like sit down next to her all heavy, like, oh, got to rest my feet, you know, and she goes, yeah. And I kind of look, I look down in her lap and she's got this um, very colorful journal in her lap. And I say, is that Lisa Frank? And she goes, oh, you know Lisa Frank? Lisa Frank was really popular for those of you who don't know in, in the States in the 90s. I don't know if she was here or not. Um, but I was a big fan, big fan. Uh, and so I, I immediately like scooch closer to her and we're talking about like how we both had these, um, these colorful posters of purple whales and blue horses on our wall as kids. And so we're, we're bonding. But of course my aim is not the book. She had her employee badge clipped to her belt at her hip and I'm sitting on her right side. And the boss cloner, the bag with the boss cloner, was practically pressed up against her reader, or her, her, um, her badge. And I had a, an Android phone with the app for, for the boss cloner installed on my, on my phone in my back pocket, and I felt the vibration, which meant we'd gotten a read. And I said, yes. 
So after a few more minutes of um, bonding over this cute little book, real picture, <laughs> I was like, can I take a picture of it? She was like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I made my excuse. I was like, okay, I've got to get back to work. Thank you very much. I will, uh, I hope, I hope I see you again soon. She's like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you later. And so we get up and, or I get up and I walk, waddle with my big, heavy pregnant belly towards the turnstiles. And on my way, I've got, um, I've got the, the new red, like the brand new cloned card in a, in an aluminum Faraday cage in my bag. And I pull it out and I approach the turnstile. And holy crap, <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. It was that easy. So now I am officially on the secure side of the secure facility. And after that, getting past the front doors, which I was also supposed to badge through, was simple because somebody practically dove to open the door for me. So now I'm inside multinational cube farm secure facility. I immediately started getting to work. Um, you got to be careful about how quickly you move around in these places. Um, I had not actually held an office job at this point. And so like, I, I was kind of taking the lead of, of the people who were moving around me. I was like, OK, I can't, I can't just walk in circles. I've got to like, go and sit down at the, in, the, in the, like, the, the break area for a little bit, um, find an empty desk. Uh, and kind of subtly plant things as I move very slowly through this facility. I was leaving drop boxes and uh, man in the middle key loggers, which are a lot of fun. Um, and we didn't actually want to leave a bunch of listening devices because we didn't want to lose them. And so I was given a bunch of these like fuzzball craft things and was like taping them under desks and conference rooms and stuff, and they were supposed to, uh, supposed to be listening devices. And I was given a bunch, a, a, a couple um, of these U USB looking things called rubber duckies and told to plug them in if I saw any unlocked computers. And at first he was like, yeah, I'm going to give you rubber duckies and I need you to plug them, plug them in. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Hackers have a really funny vernacular. It's like a totally different language that I am slowly learning, but I'm absolutely in love with. And so I, I was like, what, what? I mean, cool. I'll bring a couple duckies from my kid's bathtub. Like, what, what are you talking about? He's like, no, no, no. They're, they're, they are actually these um, USBs that act like keyboards. And uh, you plug them into unlocked computers, and they'll spit out a shell that goes off to my hackers who are waiting wherever, and they then have full access to that computer that I've just plugged into, which is pretty freaking phenomenal. So I'm walking around looking for unlocked computers, and I'm not really finding any. I'm like, dang, I really wanted to use this. I really wanted to get him like full access, which is when I walked past a name that I recognized. <laughs> <laughs> Sophia. I saw her through her door, sitting at her desk, working on her computer. And uh, so I was like, OK, well, I want to keep my eye on her just to see what happens. Like, the chances of me being able to do anything with the information that I already have on her is pretty minimal. <clears throat> but still, like, there's, there's an, there might be an opportunity and opening. I'd done a little bit of, like, OSINT research on her and knew a little bit about how to build rapport with her if I needed to. Um, and so I, I caught a desk. There was an empty desk uh, nearby where it was, she was in my line of sight. So I sat down and I pulled out my computer. I pretended to do a little bit of work. And about an hour later, she gets up and there were a group of employees that were headed to lunch. And uh, I heard them talking about going to this restaurant nearby. So I was like, OK, they're going to be gone for a little bit. Let's see, let's see what I can do. And after they left, I went into her office. And um, she had left her laptop there, along with 
Are you peeking? <laughs> so now I have the, the, the missing piece of this puzzle. I have her username, password, and YubiKey. And her password was so simple that I had, I, I had memorized it. I, um, I called up Matt and I was like, guess what? <laughs> Just be on the lookout for, for a shell. And so I naturally log her in. Um, and I'm, I plug in uh, the ducky. About a minute later, I hear back from Matt. OK, we're good. I've got it. I've got the shell. Awesome. And I'm sitting there. Like, I shut everything down. And then I was just sitting there for a little bit, making sure he got everything, um, and wondering if there wasn't anything else I should be doing with the access that I had gotten. It's in an email, or I, don't, I didn't know. I was, I was just sitting there trying to problem solve and make the most of the opportunity. When somebody walked around the corner with a, just a stack of papers, and he looked kind of distracted. He walked into Sophia's office and he stopped dead in his tracks when he saw me. And he backed up a couple feet and looked at her, looked at her nameplate. Just like to, to make sure he wasn't crazy, that he was where he thought he was. He walked back and he goes, you are not Sophia. What are you doing on Sophia's computer? <laughs> this is a risk you run doing physicals, especially when you're messing around inside people's offices during the day on their computers, immediate, instant suspicion. And what I want to do in this situation is grab my stuff and go hide in a boiler room. <laughs> like, oh my God, <laughs> what, do you, what, do you even, what do you even say? How do you begin to approach that? But that's the wrong answer. And so instead of panicking, I decided to present myself as kind of an authoritative figure. And I said, I, I kind of scored myself off to him. I shook his hand. I made sure my badge was in full view. And I kind of caught his name on his badge as I was shaking his hand. Said, Mr. Smith. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm with Information Security. The shareholders that are here this week brought me along to do just a quick security assessment on what's going on inside this building so that they have an idea of, you know, things like UB keys being left, which is what Ms. Vallis did. And he kind of got scared a little bit at that point. He's like, is she in trouble? It's like, no, 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 no. The shareholders just want, like I said, a, a really high level idea of things like unlock computers, shred bins, you know, being left unopened, things, things like that. Nobody's in trouble. You know these guys, they're just trying to, to cover their ass, essentially. And as I'm talking to him, I'm kind of gathering my things up. I'm talking to him as if I'm an ally. I'm not freaking out. I'm not panicked. So why should he be? And he drops the papers off at Sophia's desk and kind of walks out with me. And says, okay, so he, he's kind of relieved at this point. Like, I've, I've, made, I've made him understand that nobody's in trouble. I'm obviously legit. <laughs> obviously. And so he kind of walks beside me going through the hallway. He goes, so, so you're with the shareholders. So you're from out of town? I was like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just visiting for a couple days um, while the meetings are going on. Um, actually from Dallas, so I don't really know anything about this area. And he launches into his, like, well, if you haven't been here before, then may, may I suggest these restaurants? May I, you know, I, they, if you have some time to go sightseeing, the, the, the Lake Ontario is fantastic. Um, and so at this point, I'm, I've, I've pretty much captured his, his attention. I've gotten his trust. And I say, you know, I really could. I really could go for some coffee right now. Where's the break room? Why the break room? Because I want everyone to see me talking to this guy. Because he knows everyone. He belongs there. People know his face. They don't know my face. But if they see me talking to him, I immediately get that credibility through association. So we go and we hang out in the, in the break room for a little bit. We chat for a while. I said, OK, well, you know, I'm just going to go make one more round around the offices and make sure nobody's left their passwords on, uh, on uh, post-it notes, essentially. And he was like, yeah, that would be silly. 
<laughs> and so I, I leave and I go and find a desk and um, wait for the heat to die down a little bit. Um, but because I had that credibility, I could then escalate a little bit um, and get into a little bit more trouble without raising so many eyebrows. Um, after everyone had left for the day, uh, I got into shredded bins. I went and um, found some C-suite offices that I was then able to break into and gain access to the files that they had on their desk and in their cabinets, things that, again, they just don't expect people to see because this is a trusted environment. At that point, I had accomplished everything that I had come there to do and more. Um, and while I was doing the rest of my stuff internally, Matt was inside Sophia's account, escalating privileges, and eventually got some pretty interesting information on this particular product that they were holding so closely to their chest. We treat, a lot of companies do, treat physical insecurity as they are two completely separate departments. But the fact is that one affects the other in a very real, real way. And just like the physical affects the logical, the logical affects the, the physical as well. Nowadays, we have everything. We live in a networked world. We have smartphones, our doorbells are smart, our TVs are, toasters, you have smart light bulbs. I just found out on the flight to Australia that they have smart luggage, apparently. I had not heard of this until recently. Um, but we have example upon example of how computer hacks can affect the real world, the tangible world. And these devices are making that divide ever smaller. We saw it in Stuxnet, if you want to talk about a really extreme example, where a computer worm was able to do significant damage to Iran's nuclear facilities. This was a, uh, this was a headline. It came out in 2016. Hackers remotely kill a Jeep on the highway with me in it. When it comes to a personal level, there are privacy and safety concerns when we're talking about unauthorized users having access to our personal devices. So there's a lot of crossover here. There are no islands in security. The physical affects the social and vice versa. And above it all, social reigns supreme. <laughs> That's cute. You have three-factor authentication on that door? Will you let me in? OK. <laughs> One of my favorite things to do uh, at cons like this is um, hang out at the lockpicking village. I'm a mediocre lockpick, and I'm not being modest. I, I'll go up against any of you, and I will probably be toast. But um, I can explain the basics of a lot of these locks. And I can help walk people through picking their first lock. And I love, my favorite part of it all is the expression, or the series of expressions that pass over their faces when they, when they do pop their first lock. It's this first look of like, oh my god, like accomplishment. I just, I just picked a lock. Oh my god, quickly followed by, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I just picked a lock, and I've been holding these picks for like two minutes. It makes them evaluate the security around them, the locks in their lives, on their doors, on their storefronts. Um, I got the pleasure, I had the pleasure of watching my friend Zach, uh, who's on the blue team at Walmart, watch his 15-year-old son pick his first lock. And, and he looks up, he goes, Dad, I did it! And Zach's face is like drained of blood. <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. Um, but... Not everyone is a fan, right? And this sparks off a lot of other conversations about the security in our lives. People are like, okay, well, what about 
cameras? What about these network devices? What about badges? And it leads to all of these conversations about security vulnerabilities. And while I think, I think any of you who have been involved in um, security education like this has encountered this attitude. <laughs> What's wrong with you? We actually had a woman come up to our desk at, uh, at the SparkCon. SparkCon is um, Walmart's annual InfoSec conference, um, which is where that 15-year-old picked his first lock. And as he was working on it, a woman came up to the table and uh, said, you realize you're training the next generation of burglars in this county. And I was like, good, I needed an apprentice anyway. <laughs> but it does beg the question, why do we do this? Why do we talk so openly about these systems that keep us safe, about the vulnerabilities in them? Aren't we just giving criminals the tools that they need in order to accomplish their devious means, devious ends? Uh, and if that's what you think, Think, then, and I'm, I'm saying you generally, I know nobody in this room does, but if you think that all we're doing is supplying uh, criminals with information that they're then going to use against us, I have some bad news for you. Um, imagine this is here. <laughs> they it determine criminals, if they don't know already, they have the resources to find out. But what we're doing, and I, I tried to explain it to her in, in this way. Um, let's, talk about, let's talk about medicine. And I really wanted to title this, let's talk about drugs, but legal said I could not. <laughs> so let's talk about medicine. Um, we have all of these drugs out there, all of these prescriptions. And they're main, mainly used for good. Their main forces for good. They they help us stay healthy when the natural physiology of what's going on inside our bodies is not enough. But what if there were medical professionals who refused to talk about the side effects of these drugs or the negative consequences of taking them out of fear that they would be used for bad things or out of a, a sense that they, they, they did not want to instill fear in their patients. Well, that would be pretty irresponsible, right? We need to know about the vulnerabilities in our security systems, just like people taking medicine need to know about what potentially could happen if they took this medicine. And by talking openly about these vulnerabilities or side effects, then maybe competition starts popping up saying we can do it better. And that competition drives industry. It drives improvement. It leads us to talk to each other, all of the security professionals in this room who all have different interests and passions. And we can all say, these are the problems that I'm having with the system. These are the vulnerabilities I found with this lock. And then maybe we can build on each other's knowledge. And the more eyes we have looking at a problem, the better chance we have of solving it. So we have two choices. We can stick our hand in the sand, and I now understand that ostriches don't do this, but it's still, the analogy is there. We can stick our head in the sand and pretend like these things don't exist, like these problems are, are just fantasies, and we don't need to worry about them, or we can't talk about them, or, we can educate the people who are actually making these decisions, these security decisions on a day-to-day -day basis that affect their safety at home and at work and give them the tools that they need to make educated decisions. Give them the tools and then let them decide what constitutes acceptable risk. And just like we educate Others, we educate each other. We have so many amazing things going on at this con 
this weekend. We're going to be hearing about how to make cutaways um, for, for different locks, which I'm super excited about. We have a couple very young presenters talking about uh, tamper-resistant um, tamper resistant technology, which I'm super excited about. Um, we also have uh, talks about high security lock picking by Andre and uh, a talk from another couple red teamers uh, about how to social en engineer your way into a facility using a mug and a conference room, which I will be here for. This is a fantastic opportunity. Um, this is a, a quote from a book I'm reading right now, Three Musketeers. A weak obstacle is sometimes sufficient to overthrow a grand design. And that's what we're here to do, is to make those obstacles stronger so that the grand design holds steady. This is a fantastic opportunity, and I am so very grateful for Topaz and uh, the organizers for inviting me to come down. I'm super excited about all of the different workshops in the lockpicking village. I expect that I will learn quite a bit, and I hope I can help educate as well. And so with that, um, that's, that's what I have. That's all I got. Are there any questions? Yeah. What happens with that camera on the bins? Oh, nothing. Nobody no. was watching them. <laughs> <laughs> he, his question was what, what happened with the camera on the bins, and um, either nobody was watching them or they didn't think anything of a couple of people uh, carrying a bunch of trash out in the middle of the night. Yes? So that's an interesting question. Um, ideally, I want I want a couple weeks on site. I want to see what like uh, the the coming and goings of everyone. I want to see when people arrive at work, what their what their normal dress is, what the cleaning crew looks like. I want to find out who the cleaning crew works for. There's a lot of little bits and pieces that can go into um, a realistic adversarial simulation. Unfortunately, most companies don't want to pay two weeks. I had three days. <laughs> yes? What's your uh, ratio of like, getting in and getting busted? I actually counted them the other day. I just hit 30. Um, I just hit uh, 30 physical pen tests that I've been hired for, and I've gotten into all but two. And I've never been straight up caught, but that's because my, like, I don't do. Um, pen tests for security awareness sake. I don't do physical assessments for security awareness sake. I, I do, what I do is a means to an end. Um, I, I'm part of red teams, and so I, my, the point of me is not to get caught. Um, so I, I try really hard to maintain that record so that I can end up getting my team the access that they need without setting off alarm bells and ruining their campaigns. Um, so yeah, two out of two out of thirty, I haven't gotten in. Anybody else? Yes. Are you concerned that as more and more people hear about what specifically you do, that people go, "Oh, I remember you. I read about you on that thing. You're the person that breaks into buildings." So the question is, am I worried that I'll be recognized? Um, I, I'm sure a lot of you in this room have heard of Jason Street. He's got like twice the public uh, persona that I have, and he has yet to be caught. Um, I, I have uh, different disguises and things I can throw on that I don't use during public presentations. I may one day, way in the future when I'm ready to quit. But there are ways that I can, I can change my appearance enough to where like I work, on a, I work in an internal red team now. People know who I am. And so I have to safeguard that, that alter ego um, so that when the time does come, I can just completely change my appearance and go in and hope they, they don't recognize me. You had a question? Oh, I was just going to say, is, on getting sprung, 
is the, oh, I'm legitimately here doing a security assessment. Have you had to use that other times? Like, does it generally work? Um, I've never straight up said, like, I'm doing a penetration test. I've never had to pull the card, um, if you will. We have uh, get out of jail free cards, which are just authorization permission letters, um, which is you, you pull it out of your pocket, and at that point, if they call up the chain and verify that you are who you say you are doing an assessment um, from your point of contact, then you've been caught. You've been made assessment over. Um, I've never had to pull that. Have I used, I'm with information security, I'm with security? Uh, yes, but if they don't authorize or if they don't verify that I am who I say I am, then I could have just been anybody walking in. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. So what I am is essentially a flare. I'm calling attention to, like, the, and usually the people I do these jobs for have known about these security risks for years. They know that they're a problem, and they've been screaming into the ether, please give us funding, please fix this problem. And what my team and I are able to do is then go in take advantage of those vulnerabilities, and then the, the team that was there originally who hired us to do the job turns around to sea level and says, see, we told you, can we fix this problem now? And it usually does give, give them a little bit of traction. I'll yes? Now. <laughs> Say what now? I'll that oh, you're, you're playing with a 175? <laughs> Yes. A shredder would have solved a lot of their problems. So that's the funny thing is they they had shredders in the building. I saw them. They also had shredded bins, which is not as good as a shredder. But you know, <laughs> you put stuff in it, and the idea is it's secure. It's locked, it's secure, and somebody picks it up, takes it away, and shreds it for you. And um, I don't know. I guess the the policy for using those or they weren't like strategically pl placed around the office very well. Um, I think that was maybe the problem, or they just weren't worried about that particular risk. Anybody else? Yes? In the two instances that you got busted, was it because of uh, their awareness, or was it because of a lack of uh, recon that you'd done, maybe, and you didn't know something that would have helped you to get through, or it's kind of, can you give us an idea of what the reasons were that you got busted? Sure. So um, the, the second time I did a pen test. The first time, the first pen test I did, I got in. The second time, I did not get in. And it was because the client was the same as when, the, when I did the first one. And they said, okay, well, you have this ridiculously elaborate pretext. And we don't, you know, we, we, there was no way we could have possibly protected it against that or, or stop that from happening. So the next time, maybe don't do all the prep. Don't do all the advanced work. I had like it was there was phishing going on. There was a there was phishing. I had contacts within the building who thought I was somebody I was not, um, and so it was it was pretty elaborate. But um, the second time around, I basically just walked up and said like, "Hi, I'm with the people who own your building. I need to do a walk around and talk with some people about how you're using the building and like I'm doing a, a survey." or something like that, and I had um, the VP of security like pull me into a conference room. He was like, you really thought that was going to work? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so um, I left. At some, at some level, he must have known that I was doing a security assessment because he didn't like call the cops or anything. Um, the second time I did not get in, it was the last of a series of 10 physical tests I was doing for the same company. And at that point, I had I'd made some noise. There was CCTV footage of me going around um, within the company. Like, if you see this woman, kick her out right away. Call the cops. <laughs> um, and so I, I did my prep. I did like fishing in advance. And uh, again, I was met at the door by the, the president of the facility, who was like, you need to leave. <laughs> okay. So that was that. Any other questions? 
and I will be hanging around um, the rest of the con listening to talks and at the Lockpick Village. I have a lot to learn as well. So um, I'll be around if you want to chat or if you have questions and don't want to ask them right now or if you think of them later, I'm around. So thank you so much. I appreciate it.